so I had, I'd given you these definitions uh, last time I ended with this, but let's just go over them again. End diastolic volume. What What is the end diastolic volume? Would somebody uh, like to, to venture uh, a definition for us? Um, well, yes. Yes, at the end of relaxation. So and so just listen to the, the word there. It describes itself. The end diastolic volume. So uh, diastole is when the heart is uh, relaxing, not contracting. So just before it's about to contract, just before it's about to eject blood, uh, this is the point at which the heart is maximally full of blood, right? Because we're talking about volume here. So end diastolic volume. This is the most the heart will ever hold. And then end systolic volume is uh, the volume of the heart at the end of contraction. Um, so the difference in those is called the stroke volume. That's how much uh, blood in measured in milliliters is being ejected or, or CC is being ejected uh, per stroke or per, per beat. Um, now when the heart contracts, uh, I, I cut out a picture. Of, I have, used to have this picture that uh, is kind of interesting, uh, shows the fiber directionality in the heart. And when the heart contracts, it's not just like, like this. It actually kind of rings itself out. Uh, the, the muscle fibers sort of spiral around the heart towards its apex. And as it uh, contracts, it uh, does this sort of, this sort of action, uh, sort of like wringing a towel. It, it contracts down uh, that, that uh, space, the ventricles. It's a pretty efficient way to contract, actually. Um, uh, however, it's not able to squeeze all of the blood out of uh, the heart. And um, this end diastolic volume is the maximal volume of the heart. The stroke volume is how much blood has been ejected. So uh, the percentage of end diastolic volume uh, represented by the stroke volume is what we call the ejection fraction. All right, And this is really uh, a measure of how efficient the heart is being at, uh, at e ejecting uh, blood. Because heart, everybody's heart, every person is different. Every person's heart is unique. That's a, um, a, a universal <laughs> statement there. Um, and uh, because of that, you ha everyone has uh, unique volumes. Um, so it, as a way of kind of normalizing that and, and seeing how efficient your heart is being at uh, e uh, ejecting blood, uh, rather than look at the uh, total stroke volume, you have to see what percentage uh, of the uh, capacity of the heart that is, and that's ejection fraction. Uh, and then... Um, Cardiac output is, um, is a number that represents the amount of blood that the heart is able to push out per unit of time. And so this is a function of both stroke volume and uh, your heart rate. How quickly is your heart able uh, to beat? Uh, so it's simply the product of your heart rate and your stroke volume. So milliliters per beat times beat per minute. Uh, gives you milliliters per minute. All right, so here's, uh, hopefully this was, stroke volume is a pretty straightforward concept, but uh, if you need a bit of a model to help you see it, uh, this would be like N diastolic volume, so the maximal swelled volume of the heart. Uh, there's contraction, the blood that is ejected from the pump is the stroke volume, and what's left over in the pump, you don't, you're not able to completely uh, push it all out. This is end diastolic volume. The, the percentage of this total volume represented by the stroke volume uh, is called the ejection fraction. And then, uh, then diastole is where uh, we fill the heart back up with blood for another stroke. All right, so pretty much the rest of the day here, we're going to talk about uh, various factors that can affect uh, cardiac output.
Um, and, I, and since cardiac output is simply the product of your heart rate and your stroke volume, there's going to be really two ways, uh, two general ways we can affect cardiac output. We can affect it via uh, the rate at which the heart is pumping or the volume, the stroke volume um, of, of each uh, beat of the heart. So let's start with uh, heart rate. How can we affect our heart rate? Well, there's, there's um, so we know that uh, the heart uh, is auto depolarizing, right? So it, the, the, um, the nodal cells in the uh, SA node uh, reach threshold um, and depolarize uh, autonomously. This does not mean that we cannot affect the rate at which that happens. So we don't think to ourselves, I'm going to cause my heart to beat or I'm going to cause my heart to not beat. Uh, but uh, there are mechanisms um, that are not inherent to the heart that uh, enable variation in this. Uh, these methods involve either the nervous system or the endocrine system. All right, so the, the two forms of control in the body are neural or chemical, right? Uh, neural being uh, some sort of thing in the, in the brain or uh, an uh, endocrine system, some, something from the endocrine system. So uh, first is the autonomic uh, innervation. The, we, we don't, you know, there are, uh, there are biofeedback methods whereby you can consciously try to slow your heart down, but in general, uh, that's achieved through engaging the, uh, the either parasympathetic or sympathetic autonomic nervous system, and uh, then there are, there are hormones, which we'll talk about in a minute. So, uh, first, uh, autonomic nervous system. Now, I didn't really get, I, I cut this unit out of my uh, chapter on the nervous system, uh, but here's a really, really quick uh, overview of the autonomics uh, as they relate to the heart. All of this uh, lives, uh, the, the central uh, processing centers for this uh, live in the medulla oblongata, uh, arguably the uh, primordial brain, the, the earliest or the most uh, ancient part of the brain, uh, which handles some of our most uh, vital and basic functions like maintenance of uh, regulation of heart rate. Uh, the two centers in the medulla that do this are the cardioaccelerator center or the cardio inhibitory center. So cardio acceleratory in this cartoon is uh, shown in red and the cardio inhibitory center is shown in blue. Uh, the cardio acceleratory center is part of the sympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic autonomics. You'll remember that uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic are the two autonomics and uh, they have mostly uh, diametrically opposed uh, effects in the body, although not always. There is, in the Venn diagram of those two uh, autonomic and nervous systems, there are times when they can both be engaged. Uh, they do have some, some overlapping functions. Uh, but mostly, uh, the, the kind of simplistic axiom, uh, fight or flight for the sympathetic nervous system and rest and digest for the parasympathetic nervous system uh, holds uh, true. So <clears throat> the sympathetic fibers uh, descend through the spinal cord. They, they have, so parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems have two really dramatically different ways of uh, engaging uh, with structures <coughs> in the body. Uh, sympathetic nervous system, the, uh, the neurons, the neuronal projection uh, travels down through uh, the spinal cord to have a synapse in the lateral gray horn somewhere uh, in the spinal cord. And then uh, the, uh, the secondary neuron emerges from the uh, ventral root of the spinal cord uh, and, and uh, blends into a spinal nerve you can see here uh, where the uh, 
this is the dorsal root, the dorsal root ganglion. The dorsal root is all uh, sensory neurons, if you may remember, and this is, uh, and the ventral root is all motor neurons. They blend together to form a, sp a spinal nerve. This is all uh, review. Uh, a spinal nerve is a mixed nerve. It has both afferent and efferent fibers in it from either the dorsal uh, root or the ventral root. But uh, this is, we're talking about efferent here because we're trying to control the heart. So uh, this motor neuron, sympathetic motor neuron, emerges from the uh, ventral root, becomes part of uh, the spinal uh, nerve, and then uh, has this branch that comes off and goes into this sort of parallel um, part of the nervous system uh, called the sympathetic chain ganglia or the sympathetic chain. It is outside the, the actual vertebral column. So uh, the spinal cord would be surrounded by a vertebra and then on the posterior wall of the, um, the ventral body cavity, uh, there is a whole chain of uh, these sympathetic ganglia that run uh, a different ganglia for each uh, vertebral segment that runs down the ventral body cavity. Well, the sympathetic nerve goes into the sympathetic chain, has a synapse in that ganglia. You'll remember that a ganglia is uh, defined simply as a cluster of cell bodies uh, that is in the periphery somewhere. This is where synapses happen. Uh, so the sympathetic uh, synapse happens in the sympathetic chain ganglia, and then we have a projection uh, to the heart via this uh, cardiac nerve. The cardiac nerves come off of the sympathetic uh, chain ganglia. All autonomics uh, are going to have some autonomic efferent uh, fibers are going to have some kind of synapse outside of the central nervous system. And sympathetic synapse happens in the sympathetic chain ganglia, whereas uh, all parasympathetic synapses happen uh, what's called uh, paramurally. They happen uh, right on the surface of the uh, organ that they're uh, innervating. So we'll get to parasympathetic in a moment. Um, yeah, the, the sympathetic ganglia come uh, through the, uh, the signal comes out of the sympathetic chain ganglia through the cardiac nerve and uh, comes into contact with the, the conduction system of the heart and is able to accelerate the rate of uh, depolarization and thus the beating of the heart. We'll see how that works uh, exactly in a bit. Uh, on the other hand is the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, we have uh, the cell body originating in uh, the cardioinhibitory center. Uh, you have a projection that uh, stays within the medulla to uh, the nucleus of the vagal, uh, the vagus nerve, the vagal nuclei. Uh, the, the vagus nerve I've talked about a little bit. Have I talked about the vagus nerve? forget sometimes what I did and didn't touch. It's one of the, the 12 cranial nerves. I said I've talked about uh, in general what cranial nerves are, um, and I think I pointed out a couple that would be important. The vagus is, is an important one uh, for our, our class here at least, uh, because um, the name vagus, V-A-G-U-S, is related to the, um, the Latin word vagrant, um, meaning wanderer. It is the wanderer of the body, and it innervates all kinds of things uh, from the, um, the lungs. It is involved in the heart, uh, the digestive system. It innervates a lot of uh, the viscera in the body. Um, uh, cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve. Well, uh, the vagus nerve uh, carries, amongst the other things, it carries these uh, fibers these parasympathetic efferent uh, fibers, uh, uh, GVE fibers, general visceral efferent fibers, uh, along the vagus nerve. Um, and it uh, goes all the way, sends a branch right to the heart uh, where there's going to be this synapse in what's called the cardiac plexus. So I talked about a plexus uh, the, I talked about the cervical plexus as an example of plexuses. There's many of them in the body. Um, and this is simply a mixing of nerves uh, that uh, happens along to distribute various properties 
in each of the individual fibers that make up. It. There's this cardiac plexus here. We have a synapse on the surface of the heart, and then uh, it comes in contact with the same elements in the conduction uh, system and slows the heart rate down. Okay. Question about the wiring there a little bit? No. Nope. So here's how it actually works. The top uh, panel is a normal heart. It's a normal heart rate. Uh, you're sitting there listening to me, and your heart is maybe beating at 75 beats per minute. Uh, the threshold is, is at um, maybe minus 40 millivolts. And uh, when, uh, so the cell begins to spontaneously depolarize, it reaches threshold and, uh, and we get uh, a depolarization and then a repolarization uh, with uh, the subsequent um, spontaneous depolarization that happens uh, at the prepotential until we reach threshold again. Uh, the, the specifics of this uh, give rise to the heart rate that we see there. Um, so now, let's imagine that, um, let's close our eyes and imagine that we are sitting uh, in a beautiful wooded forest and uh, the, the, uh, beside a, a waterfall with a nice mossy, on a, on a mossy bed, um, around us, thick, green, verdant smells filling our nose, the sound of tinkling water, a gentle mist on our face, the, uh, the uh, tests and, and rigors of, of midterm week all successfully way in the rearview mirror. We're just sitting here um, in, enjoying this restful, peaceful, uh, bucolic uh, environment. So as we, as we sit here, uh, imagining that, um, we are engaging uh, the parasympathetic nervous system, and our heart rate is slowing down, perhaps. Our, our heart rate is just ever so slightly uh, slowing down. Uh, this is called bradycardia. Bradycardia. Uh, bradycardia is uh, simply the slowing uh, of the heart rate. Well, how does this happen? This happens because uh, the synapses that are happening on the, um, <coughs> on the pacemaker cells of the heart uh, from these parasympathetic uh, fibers, these GVE fibers, general visceral efferent fibers, uh, are... Um, inhibitory. They're inhibitory synapses where they, when this cell is uh, repolarizing, in fact, it doesn't just go to minus 60, it hyperpolarizes. It actually enables uh, the cell to go to an even lower uh, base hyperpolarization. So that now, as it spontaneously depolarizes, it has further to go to reach this threshold, the minus, uh, the minus 40. And because it has further to go, it takes longer to get there. Consequently, uh, the heartbeats are spaced further and further apart. All right? That slows our heart rate. The parasympathetic uh, autonomics are not initiating a heart rate uh, or stopping uh, the, the beating of the heart in any way. They are simply uh, changing the membrane dynamics in between hearts. The spontaneous depolarization, which is inherent to the heart, uh, is still uh, completely active. All right, does this make sense? Yes, no? Okay. So I'm sorry to take you away from uh, the gentle wooded glade that I just had you in, uh, but now... Let's go to um, a death metal concert. We're at a death metal concert uh, by what? A band called Gwar. Has anyone heard of the band Gwar? Horrible, horrible death metal uh, kitschy band. 
And uh, you have to, you realize at this super loud, chaotic death metal concert that you are getting sprayed with fake blood at in the front row that, oh my God, you have forgotten that you have to take this take home 30 page exam for your, your bio astrophysical chemistry class that you are taking that is crucial to you getting into whatever program, the space program that you need to get into to be a successful person. And you are probably going to end up uh, an utter, utter failure living in a dumpster for the rest of your life. It's horrible. Okay. So now as you think about this, the situation you found yourself in, uh, your, your sympathetic nervous system is, is getting engaged and you're thinking, I need to fight, but I can't. There's nowhere to fight. It's just myself. So I need to run, but I'm stuck with myself. Where do I run? You're getting anxious. You're getting anxious now. And as that happens, the sympathetic nervous system is getting fired up. It's getting fired up. Uh, and the cardio acceleratory system, I'm getting fired up, is, is sending out these signals. And there's synapse in the sympathetic chain ganglia. And the cardiac nerve is firing, firing, firing the heart on the pacemaker cells in the heart. What's happening? These are... Um, potentiating, potentiating the, the uh, membrane so that after you have a heartbeat, and it's just like any other heartbeat, uh, but you do not repolarize quite as much. You don't repolarize quite as much, and so you're much closer to threshold than you were before. <laughs> and it takes much less time. So you'll notice here that the slope of this uh, spontaneous depolarization is the same. It's the same slope. So the dynamic in the heart is the same. We're just changing. We're just changing the depths of this repolarization. All right, uh, by the types, either uh, excitatory or inhibitory. Excitatory for sympathetic or inhibitory for parasympathetic uh, nervous system on these pacemaker cells. All right. So speeding the heart. This is called tachycardia. Tachycardia, and uh, tachycardia, it just like, um, does anyone, uh, know how to drive a, a vehicle with a stick shift, a manual transmission? So when you're, when you're doing that, um, sometimes when people are, uh, doing that, they they look at, uh, the tachometer, right? And that's showing the RPM on the thing and you shift at just the right tech, um, or whatever. And it comes from the same uh, root word here. So it just means speed, tachycardia. Uh, is a speeding of, of the heart rate, all right? Tachometer, tachycardia. Uh, questions on this? Okay, we're, we're not at the death. That was a bad dream. It's over. Sorry. Go back. Let's go back to the, the stream. Um, all right, so <clears throat> uh, I'm going to skip over the hormones a little bit. I'm going to skip over the hormones as a way to uh, accelerate the heart. Uh, but I will say this, that uh, I, I might get to it at the end, but um, the effect is the same. The effect is the same. It's just changing uh, the effect of various uh, maybe epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, is going to have an effect on the polarization, the repolarization level and uh, the, the time course of that spontaneous depolarization. The effect is exactly the same. All right. Let's move to the other side of the equation, the stroke volume. So the things that can affect stroke volume, um, it gets a little bit more uh, sophisticated. And we know that, uh, so how do we calculate stroke volume? We calculate it by, it's the difference uh, between the end diastolic volume and the end systolic volume. All right. So the question is to affect stroke volume, uh, we can affect it on either end, either by affecting what our end diastolic volume is or what our end systolic volume is. Either of those is going to affect stroke volume. And let's take them uh, one at a time. Um, end diastolic volume is principally uh, a uh, function of the preload. Now remember, preload is uh, really just 
the um, the blood pressure in the venous uh, circulatory system, the, the blood that's returning, the blood return. It's how much load we're pre, uh, pre how much blood we're preloading into the heart before contraction. All right. Um, and what things affect preload? Well, a couple different factors, either venous return or filling time. So venous return uh, is related to how much blood, what, what the blood pressure is in uh, that on the venous side, how much blood is actually being, uh, is, is being returned, what's the volume of blood that's being returned uh, uh, on the venous side, uh, what, so I guess the, the pressure of that blood or what, what is the current uh, of blood that's passing uh, through the, the vena cava, and then uh, the filling time. So uh, how long are we letting uh, the um, how long are we letting the atria and ventricles filled? So as you increase uh, venous return, as there is uh, a larger venous pressure uh, pushing blood back to the heart, we have increased <coughs> end diastolic volume. So. You know, I've talked to a couple of you students uh, outside of class about uh, calcium homeostasis. And one of the points that I had made to you was that, uh, maybe I didn't make this in class or not, but was to, rather than memorize all of these different relationships, because like this slide is actually kind of daunting. I remember when I first saw this slide, I was like, oh shit, this is a lot on there. On one slide, a lot of little relationships, little arrows up and down. Um, and the same with the homeostasis of calcium. Don't think about it like that. Think about it like understand the overarching purpose of the concept you're trying to get here. Like uh, we are, if, if calcium is low in the blood, we want to raise it. And if it's high in the blood, we want to lower it down. And then just learn the, the members, like the players in the story, and you should be able to logically piece them together. You should be able to logically piece them together. All right. So uh, we know that cardiac output uh, is raised by having a higher heartbeat or having a higher stroke volume. All right. So if we want cardiac output to go up, we want stroke volume to go up. Um, stroke volume is dependent upon there being a larger, it's, positively correlated with a large volume of blood that's being ejected. So end diastolic volume, that's how much blood you start with. The more that goes up, the more your stroke volume should go up. All right, these are, these are logical relationships here. Uh, so if uh, venous return, as you pump more blood into the heart, that should increase uh, and diastolic volume. These are logical relationships that should follow from one another. So what you need to memorize is uh, that venous return and filling time are players, uh, and that can affect the preload and end diastolic volume, which then affects stroke volume uh, and then cardiac output. The specifics of those relationships uh, should be intuitive if you just uh, think about what's actually happening in the physical system here. Is that... You following me? Now I'll go through each of them specifically for you. But uh, So as venous return goes down, your end diastolic volume goes down. As end diastolic volume goes down, <coughs> stroke volume goes down. As stroke volume goes down, cardiac output goes down. All right? So it's just a set of dominoes there. And likewise with filling time. The longer you let the heart fill before contraction, the more blood you're going to be able to fill, uh, fit into it. Now, it's not a linear relationship. There is a law of diminishing returns there, of course. Uh, but in general, increase in filling time uh, equals an increase in end diastolic volume. Uh, so that's, uh, that's EDV. On the other side is end systolic volume. How much blood are we able to pump out of the heart? And this is a function of really uh, two things. Uh, contractility and... Uh, and, and afterload. It is indirectly related to preload, but I, I don't want to get into that uh, can of worms quite yet. Uh, so contractility and uh, and afterload. Um, let's let's start with uh, 
Let's start with afterload because this is the one that we've already sort of talked about in class. Afterload, uh, what is afterload? Does anyone remember what I said afterload was? You guys remember? So if I said preload was the um, preload was the venous blood pressure related to venous blood pressure, uh, what is what is afterload? When we go back here. <coughs> When we go back here, we see that the heart is contracting. It can't actually, in the first phase of systole, ventricular systole, it can't actually eject the blood until the blood pressure in the ventricle equals that of the aorta. Okay? And so uh, that blood pressure in the aorta can be higher or lower, depending on who you are, and et cetera, a number of uh, factors. Uh, this is what's called afterload. Afterload. It's the heart that's already after. Uh, it's the blood that's already after the heart that the heart has to work against to open up that aortic valve and eject the blood. You guys following this? Who's not? Okay. I don't know. I just want students to be honest. Oh. Tell me the truth. Um. All right. So afterload is um, positively correlated with an increased. Uh, systolic volume. But end systolic volume, as the, the larger your end systolic volume is, that means that that's blood you're leaving on the table, that you're not, that you're not actually pumping out of the heart. It's, it's blood that's reserved still in the heart. All right. So uh, increased end systolic volume means uh, reduced ejection fraction and reduced stroke volume. All right. So as your, your afterload goes up, as your blood pressure goes up, your, you have, your heart has a reduced stroke volume, all right? Because the doors of the, um, the doors of the aorta, if this blood pressure is, if your aortic blood pressure is really high, these doors are going to shut sooner then they might otherwise if you had lower blood pressure. If you had lower blood pressure, then you're going to get rid of a, a little bit more of that blood in the heart. Okay? Sorry. Uh, so afterload, uh, increased afterload is going to mean less heart, uh, less blood is ejected from the heart, uh, going to mean decreased stroke volume. So what affects afterload? Um, if you have a number of things, Will, but uh, increased vasoconstriction uh, is going to increase afterload. And when I say vasoconstriction, I mean uh, the, the constricting of the blood vessels on the arterial side. This is really just reducing the volume of your va cardiovascular system. Right? And if you're reducing the volume, you're going to be increasing the pressure of that blood there. Vasoconstriction leads to an increase in blood pressure. Uh, as to what causes vasoconstriction, there's various things, the endocrine discussion that we'll get into eventually. But, uh, <clears throat> and then if you have vasodilation where those vessels get bigger, there's a larger volume, the blood pressure will, your, your arterial blood pressure will drop. Um, if that happens, uh, you are going to decrease um, afterload and decrease end systolic volume. If you decrease end systolic volume, that means more blood is being ejected. You have a larger stroke volume and you are able to uh, have higher cardiac output. This is why well-trained athletes uh, – it, they have, they're the most efficient if they are able to maintain a low blood pressure during, uh, during their peak performance because their heart is able to, they have a higher ejection fraction because they have lower uh, afterload. You guys following that? All right. So now contractility. Contractility just means, uh, so we talked about uh, skeletal muscle a little bit. Cardiac muscle is striated as well. It has the same sarcomere structure. Um, and remember I showed you that chart that uh, had a picture of resting, mu resting muscle length and tension produced, um, right? 
So there's like an optimal length of, car of, of muscle tissue. Same thing happens in the heart. That's related to contractility. So how much uh, is that cardiac muscle able to contract? Is it able to contract significantly or, or not? Various things affect that. Uh, both nervous system and endocrine system. The nervous system is by the same uh, usual characters here, either sympathetic or parasympathetic. So obviously sym sympathetic nervous system is going to increase contractility. Uh, parasympathetic will decrease contractility. That should all be uh, intuitive there. Uh, and then uh, there's various uh, hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, glu uh, glucagon, thyroid hormones all which uh, are going to increase the contractility. Um, yeah. Epinephrine, norepinephrine uh, coming from the suprarenal glands, glucagon coming from the pancreas, thyroid hormones, obviously from the thyroid. Um, all right, so do you guys get those relationships on, on, with stroke volume there? Is there? Any of those relationships not sort of sinking in? I think you can get a handle on that. All right, so here is uh, a summary of, of all of this. Um, the, both the heart rate and stroke volume all on, on, one, on one chart. Um, and I, I've highlighted the direct correlations in green and inverse correlations in, uh, in orange. So heart rate and stroke volume are both directly correlated with cardiac output. Uh, autonomic innervation has uh, sympathetic uh, heart uh, sympathetic nervous system increases, heart rate parasympathetic decreases. All these endocrine hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, glucagon, thyroid hormone, all increase heart rate. Uh, we won't talk about the atrial uh, reflex. We don't have time to go through that. But um, and then on the stroke volume side, end diastolic volume, the, the amount of blood that is in the heart before contraction is directly correlated with stroke volume. So the more blood you have, the more you can eject. Uh, the end, systol end systolic volume is inversely correlated, meaning uh, the more blood that's left over afterwards, after a contraction, meaning the less blood you actually uh, pumped out. So this is an inverse correlation. Uh, end diastolic volume is a, is a, fact, a function of preload, which is directly uh, correlated with venous return and filling time. Um, I didn't talk about this, but venous return uh, itself is a function of these uh, two things. First of all, blood volume. Um, so what is your, are you hypervolemic or have you lost blood or do you have uh, a high blood volume? That gets into the renal chapter. We'll talk about uh, blood pressure and, uh, and such in the renal chapter a little more. But um, uh, skeletal muscle activity. So as the way your body pumps blood back to the heart, uh, we have these venous valves that you are, are, may be aware of or not. Blood is not able to flow backwards along your veins. There are these valve, intermittent valves. And the way blood returns to the heart is through the contraction of your muscles where the veins are, squeezes on the veins, and the blood can't go backwards, so it's got to go forwards. Uh, so as you begin to physically be active, uh, you increase venous return. All right, You're able to, to push, your, you increase that venous blood pressure, which is a good thing, uh, and then you increase preload and the amount of heart uh, blood that is getting into the heart. Um, on this side, end systolic volume is a function of contractility and afterload. Afterload is uh, increased by vasoconstriction, so that's your blood your arterial blood pressure goes up. Your heart has to work against more blood, uh, so um, vasoconstriction is inversely correlated with cardiac output because it is inversely correlated with stroke volume because it is. Uh, conversely correlated with afterload and the opposite for uh, vasodilation. So um, this is just a summary of everything I've already talked about. Uh, is that is all that fairly clear? I'll put it on one slide for you. All right. So what is important in this one? 
blood pressure is what's important here. Um, so we can see here that this top is uh, this top panel looks at the vessel diameter. At, uh, so this goes from the aorta through the capillaries to the vena cava. This is your entire circulatory circuit uh, coming around from the aorta, going through the peripheral uh, blood uh, capillary beds back to the heart. And the diameter goes uh, from high to low to high. And the cross-sectional area goes from low to high to low, however. Even though these they are really small, there's actually a lot more cross-sectional area in the capillaries uh, than there is in the arteries or the veins. Uh, you may not think that's the case, but it is. Um, and because of that, the blood pressure drops. The blood pressure begins to drop because we've gone way up in cross-sectional area. Um, that same blood volume uh, gets uh, distributed across a much larger area, and thus the pressure is going to go down as it returns. Um, and then you can see that uh, because of that, the velocity of blood flow goes down, and it goes up a little bit because we have such a huge increase in, uh, I'm sorry, a huge decrease in, in vessel uh, cross-sectional area. All right. So just a few uh, points on blood pressure, a couple uh, definitions. Hypotension is low blood pressure. Uh, and a person who's like below 90 over 60, 90 being the systolic pressure, 60 being the uh, diastolic pressure, you get a little bit vertiginous. Um, so for example, for example, I talked about orthostatic uh, blood pressure, like when you get up, uh, really quickly for old people whose carotid bulbs become stenotic, uh, they, their blood pressure drops pretty rapidly in the, in the head. And they get dizzy and you can pass out. I'm sure most of us have had a little bit of a lightheaded moment when you got up too quickly sometimes. Uh, and then hypertension uh, is more of a chronic uh, problem for uh, for more people uh, and this can lead to coronary artery disease because of high blood pressure you get turbulent uh, flow in the uh, coronary arteries of the heart you get uh, a higher incidence of stroke heart attack heart failure etc 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 I'm not gonna I want to make some more interesting points than going through the ranges uh, however so I'm gonna I, I skip that bottom panel let's not worry about it all right so how do we actually um, how do we actually regulate the blood pressure? Uh, the hormones, the hormonal thing, I'll, I'll cover in the renal unit because the endocrine system's ability to to maintain blood pressure um, is, is really revol revolves around the kidney, which is why I kind of skipped it back in the uh, preload par portion of the cardiodynamics there. Well, we can talk about the nervous system, though, and the, and the effect of the nervous system on blood pressure. Um, there's uh, an involvement of the central nervous system and an involvement of the peripheral nervous system. Uh, the central nervous system uh, works via the hypothalamus and, uh, and various nuclei in the medulla. The hypothalamus uh, will skip because uh, the hypothalamus is really the bridge between the central nervous system and the endocrine system as it pumps into the pituitary, and that'll be this ADH vasopressin uh, uh, part of the renal chapter. But uh, the medulla we'll lo look at in just a moment. And then in the peripheral nervous system, uh, there's the, the afferent side. So when you're thinking about the peripheral nervous system, there's afferents and there's efferents, right? The afferent side... Uh, the sensory input comes from the baroreceptors that are in the carotid bulb that I've talked about many times at the carotid bifurcation in the throat and uh, in the aortic arch. There's also pressure receptors, baroreceptors that are in the aortic arch. Um, then in terms of the efferents, uh, it's both sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, uh, outflow that we've, we've already uh, seen a little bit. I'm going to unpack it uh, just a bit. Um, so here is uh, the CNS, um, the CNS part. And we talked about uh, the vagus nerve for the parasympathetic efflux, and then I talked about um, the cardio-acceleratory nerves 
that come off the sympathetic chain ganglia uh, that, uh, <coughs> that increase the heart rate. There are also sympathetic fibers that come out of the uh, same nucleus in the in medulla that are going to affect the blood uh, vessels that lead to vasoconstriction. Uh, they're going to close down uh, the blood vessels, thus increasing afterload and, um, uh, and uh, decreasing stroke volume. Uh, what else? So that's that. Then up on the top um, is um, there, there is input. So I, I had you guys sit there and think about uh, being next to the stream with the waterfall or being at the nasty uh, death metal concert. Not in case any of you like death metal. Death metal's great, lovely death metal people out there. But. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, how was I doing that? There are cortical projections. There are uh, higher cortex projections uh, from the cerebrum down into the brainstem that can affect uh, this, this output. Um, and we'll skip the uh, hypothalamus. The rest of that was all in the medulla. All right. So uh, then here is uh, the PNS part. A diagram that helps you uh, put this into context again. So I had shown this diagram, and that little bit more complicated diagram earlier, of the sympathetic output, uh, output that goes to the sympathetic chain. Uh, we have that cardiac nerve that goes right to the heart, but we also have these other, uh, these other uh, sympathetic nerves that come off the sympathetic chain ganglia uh, that go to the, that uh, affect both afterload and preload. Of, of these vessels. Meanwhile, the parasympathetics uh, come uh, directly out of uh, the brainstem via the vagus nerve. Um, and then some of the other cranial nerve, well, vagus nerve brings back the aortic arch, uh, glossopharyngeal nerve, which is another, uh, is another cranial nerve, brings it back uh, from the carotid bulb. All right, I was going to talk about uh, alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2 receptors, uh, sympathetics, but I'm not, I don't have time. That's okay. It doesn't matter. We, we covered a lot. Um, are there any questions? The heart is a beautiful thing. <laughs>